Next, let's jump right into part two of chapter six. We're going to look at the hair and nails. Now, hair and nails and, and cutaneous glands um, are accessory um, organs of, of the skin. The hair and nails are composed of mostly hard um, keratin rather than soft keratin. Now, a hair is almost known is also known as pilus, and is um, a slender filament of keratinized cells that grows from a hair follicle. Hair is found almost everywhere on the body except the palms and soles of the feet, the palm of the plantar and lateral surfaces and distal segments of the fingers and toes and the lips, the nipples and parts of the genitals. Now when we look at the limbs and trunks, now over it covers the hair covers approximately uh, 55 to 70, 70 um, centimeters per um, centimeter square of those particular areas of the body. Now the face, um, the face has about ten times as many er as different parts of the body, um, depending on who the individual is and you know um, genetic makeup. Some people have had have hair on on their back and it's very very hairy on their chest. Some of them will have to shave, you know, due to maybe they might be embarrassed or they don't want to be made fun of. Now, there's approximately 30,000 hairs in a man's beard and 10, I mean 100,000 hairs on, a, on an average person's scalp. Now, the um, number of hairs does not differ from person to person or even um, between sexes. Differences in appearance due to texture and pigmentation of the skin. Now, um, over the, the course of a lifetime, a person grows three kinds of hair. We have a, a manigo, which is a fine, downy, unpigmented pigmented hair that appears on the fetus in the first three months of delivery. Sorry, of, de of development, sorry. Um, a vellus is fine, pale hair that replaces the, the lanago by the time of birth. Um, it is it is the body hair of children and it comprises or comprises, sorry, of two thirds of the body hair of women and one tenth of the body hair of men. The terminal hair is longer, coarser, and pigmented. It forms the eyebrows and the eyelashes. It covers the scalp and after puberty it forms the it, it forms the axillary and the pubic hair, the male facial hair, and some hair on the trunk and and on the limbs. Now, structurally, a hair has three zones um, along its length and three layers in section. And three, yes, yeah, in, 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 in sorry, and three <laughs> layers in cross section. We have the bulb. The bulb is a swelling of the base of where the hair originates. Then we have um, where it's going to sorry where it's going to originate in the dermis or the or the or the hypodermis. Then we have the root. The root is the what you have here. I'm sorry. Here's the hair bulb. Here's the hair root, and it is the remainder of the hair within the within the hair follicle. Now the shaft itself, that is the portion of the hair above the skin. Now the only living cells of hair are in and near the bulb, which grows around the bulb of vascular connective tissue called the dermal papillae. And this provides the hair with a sole source of nutrition. Immediately above the papillae is a region of, um, of active cells and um, the hair matrix, which is the hair's growing center, which is mentioned right here, and here's the dermal papillae. This is the great hair gland. Now, in cross section, the internal the innermost layer of the skin is the uh, sorry of the hair is the medulla, which is a core of loosely arranged cells um, and air spaces. Did you see it here? Mm -hmm. And it's the most prominent and thick hairs 
such as um, those of the eyebrows. Now the cortex, the cortex is external to the medulla, of the, yes, of the medulla, and it um, constitutes most of the hair, and it consists of several layers of elongated keratinized cells. Now the cuticle, the cuticle, cells that um, overlap like shingles with free edges um, directed upward. Now the hair follicle is a diagonal tube um, that extends into the dermis and sometimes into the hypodermis. Um, it has two principal layers and they're associated with nerve and fiber, nerve and muscle fibers. The epithelial root shaft um, sheath, sorry, it it lays adjacent to the hair root. It forms a bulb between the deep end, which is a source of stem cells for follicle growth. The connective tissue, um, the connective tissue root sheath, is derived from the dermis. and it surrounds the epithelial sheath and is somewhat denser than the adjacent dermal connective tissue. The nerve fibers called hair receptors um, intertwine each follicle and respond to their movements such as when a hair is touched. Now the pilorectal muscle or the pilomotor muscles or the arectal those are bundles of, um, of muscle, uh, smooth muscle cells extending from the dermal collagen fibers to the connective tissue root sheath of the follicle. The sympathetic nervous system controls contractions of these muscles in response to cold, thin, or other stimuli. So let's look at the hair texture. Hair texture is related to cross-sectional shape of the hair. Straight hair is round, wavy hair is oval, and tightly curly hair is relatively flat. Hair color is due to pigment granules in the cells of the cortex. So you see here in, this, in, in our diagram here, we have our straight, wavy, and curly, blonde straight, black straight, this is red wavy and this is gray wavy. Okay. They don't have the tightly curl, curly here. But we're going to look at what they have. We look at brown hair and black hair. They're rich in, in eumelanin. Red hair has a slightly, has a slight amount of eumelanin and a higher concentration of um, theomelanin you saw in another slide prior to this one. Now blonde hair has a more, um, has some theomelanin, but very, very little eumelanin. Gray hair and white hair result from the absence of melanins in the cortex and the absence of air in the, in the medulla.
Matrix, mitosis in the hair matrix ceases, ceases and the sheath cells below the bulge dies. Now the hair is now known as the club here. Um, the follicle starts to shrink and the derma papillae is drawn up towards the bulge.
have guard hairs, stout guard hairs. Those ones that, that guard the, the, the nostrils and the ear canals, and the, and they're there to prevent foreign particles from entering in, in into that area easily. Same for eyelashes. Um, they help shield the eye, shield the eyes from from wind blown debris, and acts as a, as a as a screen when we are squinting. Eyebrows are also presumed to keep sweat or debris out of the, out of the eyes, but um, their more important function may be in nonverbal communication through facial expression. Alright, so let's look at the fingernails and the toe nails. Fingernails and toenails are clear, hard, um, definitive, sorry, of stratum corneum, composed of very thin dead, scaly cells, densely packed together and filled with parallel fibers of hard keratin. Now, flat nails are one of the distinction, um, the, sorry, distinguishing characteristics of primers. The hard part of the nail is the nail plate, which increases the free edge and the nail body and the nail root. The free edge, as you see here, which a lot of people bite off or chips off, is the part overhanging the tip of the of the finger or the toe. The nail body, as you see here, is the visible attached part of the nail. The nail root, as you see in this particular diagram down here, the nail root extends underneath this overlaying nails, uh, overlaying skin. So for individuals that get manicures, pedicures, they're going to push back this, um, the nail fold or this, the, the skin on top, exposing the root just to put the acrylic on or to clean it up. Okay. So here's another picture of, of your nail edge, which is the, the part that sticks that hangs over the, 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 the tip of the finger or the tip of the toe. You have your nail body here. You have our nail root. Those are the three that we mentioned so far. Okay, so let's move on and we'll talk about the other layers, the other areas of the skin. Now the surrounding skin, um, it rises a bit above the nail as that nail fold, as I was talking about that nail fold is, and is separated by a margin of nail plate by a nail groove. So here's the nail plate. The nail plate consists of the nail root, the nail body, and the free edge. Now, the nail groove um, and the space underneath the nail edge collect dirt and bacteria. Epidermis of the nail bed, right here, is called the. No, sorry, is the. Well, it's not in this particular thing. Um, the epidermis of the nail bed is called the the hypomesium. Now, at the nail's proximal end, at the nail's proximal end, its stratum basal thickness uh, thickens to constitute a growth zone called the nail matrix this area over here. Now mitosis occur uh, here, account the mitosis account here, it accounts for the growth of the nail. Now the thickness of this nail, of the nail matrix, um, obscures the underlying um, dermal blood vessels, creating an opaque white crescent that we usually see right here. This white crescent called the the luna. Now a navy a, a navy a narrow zone of dead skin called the cuticle, also called the the epomysium, also overhangs this proximal end of the nail. It's right there. Now the appearance of the fingertips the of the fingertips and the nails can also be used in medical diagnosis. Um, 
swollen or club fingertips may indicate long-term um, oxygen, oxygen deficiencies, um, dietary deficiencies sometimes can be seen in the nails, such as iron deficiencies, which can cause the nails to become flat or concave. So let's look at the sweat glands. Sweat glands, um, you can see there are two kinds of sweat glands. We have the apocrine and the and the and the merocrine. The apocrine, you said we have five types here. There's five new types, but there's two kinds of that makes sense. numerous glands of the skin and it produces like watery perspiration. Now they're also essentially abundant on the palms, the soles, and the forehead, but mostly uh, distributed as or widely distributed um, as well. You find it everywhere in the body. Now each um, merocrine gland is a simple tubular gland with a twisted coil in the dermis dermis or hypodermis and an um, undilating or uncoiled duct leading to the sweat pore on the skin surface. Now this duct is lined with stratified cuboidal epithelium in the dermis and by the keratino um, <laughs> keratinocytes in the epidermis. Now among the um, this secretory cells in both the apocrine and the, the merocrine slit glands are specialized myoepithelial cells that respond to um, sympathetic nervous system stimulation and squeeze per perspiration out of the duct. kill them. 
So where would you find these sweat glands? They occur in the groin, the anal region, the axillary, the areola, and in mature males, um, the beard area. But they are absent in the axillary region of Koreans and in um, Japanese. Now, they produce secretions of exocytosis in the same way as the, um, the, the myocrine glands, but their secretory part adds a much larger lumen. The ducts of the, the African um, sweat glands lead into nearby hair follicles rather than into the, into the skin surface. Now, when we look at the sexual stimulation on stress stimulation, of these glands, the role of the glands is thought to be the production of sex pheromones that influence the physiology or behavior of members of the um, same species. Now, African glands um, does not, they don't, they, African sweat, sorry, does not have a disagreeable odor, but it, but if trapped by clothing, bacteria um, degrade and um, the bacteria will degrade the secretion make it smell and release these fatty acids with a very rancid odor. So it's not the gland, it's not the sweat itself, but it's when it's trapped in by clothes, if your clothes are smelly or maybe you, the deodorant that you have on was not rinsed away properly because um, you have didn't wash your underarms properly or various areas properly, it will cause seem like it was the sweat smelling, but it's it will give you a very pungent smell. Now, a disagreeable odor, body odor, is called boom hydrosis, and most often reflect bad hygiene. And that's where the the proper scrubbing comes into play to make sure you help with exfoliating, um, exfoliation of, of your skin, and, and make sure you clean the the hairs properly in those particular areas. Alright, now sebaceous glands produce an oily secretion called um, sebum and they are flatty discs, uh, flatty, they're flash, flash, flash shaped with um, short ducts that usually open into a hair follicle. Now these are the protocrine glands which are living visible lumen and their secretion consists of broken down cells replaced by my, mo, my, uh, mitosis. Sebum, it keeps the skin and hair from becoming dry, brittle, and of course, cracked. This is the slide for that, I'm sorry. Um, so when we look at the Now the ceraminous glands are found only in the external air canal, where their secretions um, combines the, the sebum and the dead epithelial cells to form this air wax. Now they are simple coiled tubular glands um, with ducts leading into the skin surface. Um, they keep the air drum pliable, waterproofs the canal, kills bacteria, and it coats the guard cell hairs sorry, to help with blocking foreign particles from entering the canal. Now the mammary glands are, the mammary glands and the breast, which is the mammae, are often um, regarded as one and the same, but breasts are present in both sexes and rarely contain more than small traces of mammary glands. Mammary glands are milk producing glands that develop within the female breast only after pregnancy and lactation. Mammary glands are um, modified African sweat glands that produce a richer secretion and, and, and channel it through ducts to a nipple. Now, when we take a look at, uh, ouch, a few disorders, sorry, I just hit my elbow, a few disorders.
disorders, um, skin is not only um, the most vulnerable organ to injury or disease, but it's also the one place where we will most likely notice anything out of the ordinary. So, for example, we have skin cancer. Skin cancer is induced by what? UV radiation from the sun and occurs most often on the head, the neck, and hands where exposure is the greatest. Skin cancer is most common in fair-skinned people and the elderly. The popularity of sun tanning has caused an increase of skin cancer among younger people. Almost, although a common cancer, skin cancer is one of the easiest to treat and has a high survival rate when detected and treated early. Now there are three types of skin cancer named for the epidermal skin, I mean epidermal cells from which they um, originate. That's the basal cell um, um, carcinoma, sarcinoma, we have the squamous cell um, carcinoma and the melanoma. basal cell. <coughs> Sorry. It's the most common but least deadliest type. It originates in the ba in the stra in the stratum basum basal and um, eventually invades the dermis. Now on the surface <coughs> now on the surface the lesion first appears as a small um shiny little bump that later develops into a central depression, which we see here, has a little central depression and a beaded pearly edge. Then we have our squamous. Well, the squamous cell, um, cancer cell, it arises from the keratinocytes of the stratum spinosis, spinosum, sorry, and appears most often on the scalp, the ears, the lower lip, and the back of the hand. The lesions have a raised reddish, as you see here in the diagram, raised um, reddened um, scaly appearance, and um, later this form this concave ulcer with um, raised edges. Now this cancer can metastasize to lymph nodes and it can be very lethal. Now the malignant um, melanoma, it arises from the, the melanocytes and it is extremely aggressive and is treatable if it is caught on time, caught early. The, melano the, melanon, uh, mel the melanoma metastasizes, which, um, which goes quickly and is usually fatal for the average person with uh, metastatic, metastatic melanoma lives only um, six months from diagnosis and only 5% to 14% of, of patients survive uh, for five years. Now the greatest risk factor is family history of the disease. The greatest, um, about two-thirds of cases in men result from um, a an, an oncogen. No, sorry, an oncogene called the BR, the BRAF. Let me see here. Do I have it? Do I talk about it? It's, it's the BRAF, which in women has been linked to some breast and ovarian cancer. Now, malignant melanoma can be recognized by an A, B, C. What is that? A symmetry. You guys can guys hopefully I don't know if you guys are following me in the book or not. Let's see. This is what? Good. Has my A B C rule. A B C D. I 
recognizing a malignant melanoma. A stands for asymmetry, B stands for border irregularity, C stands for color, D stands for structures are involved in 
edifices are being destroyed. Okay. All right. Um, the two most urgent um, concentrations in treating a burn patient are flu replacement and with um, infection control. Um, a patient can lose several liters of water.
is well enough for healthy skin to, to be removed from an undamaged area of the body. Pig skin is sometimes used on burn patients by uh, butt presence that presents the same problem of immune rejection. Now a graft of tissue from a different species is called heterograft or xenograft. Now this is a special graft or a special case of heterotransplant which also includes transplantation of organs such as baboon hearts or livers into the humans. Now heterographs and heterotransplants are short term methods of maintaining a person, a patient, until a better long term solution is possible. The um, immune reaction can be suppressed by drugs called immune, um, immunosuppressants and this procedure is very very risky however because it lowers a person's resistance to infection which is already compromised in a burned patient now some alternatives to skin grafts are also being used and burns are sometimes temporary, temporary co covered with with a membrane that um, surrounds a the 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 developing fetus such as the amnion. Is it, you've heard of amniotic fluid? We're talking about the amnion. Now, um, and this is what is obtained um, from afterbirths. Now, in addition, you have tiny keratite patches um, coated with growth stimulants have produced sheets of epidermal tissue as large as the entire body surface. These can replace large areas of burned tissue. Dermal fibroblast also has been um, successfully cultured and used for aut um, autographs. A drawback for, the, for these approaches is that the culture produces, um, pr um, the culture process requires three to four weeks, which is too long for any patient to work with any type of severe burns. Think of it, you're sitting in the hospital in pain, suffering from these third degree burns, and you have to sit another three to four weeks before you can, they can even start grafting your skin. That is extremely too long. Now various kinds of artificial skin um, have been developed as a temporary burn covering. One concept is a sheet with an upper layer, upper layer of silicone and a lower layer of collagen and um, of, um, of chondrodin um, sulfate stimulates the growth of connective tissue and blood vessels from the patient's underlying tissue. The artificial skin can be removed, uh, removed after three weeks and replaced with a thin layer of cultured and or graft epidermis. The manufacture of one such product begins by culturing fibroblasts on a collagen gel to produce a dermis. Then, culturing keratinocytes on this dermal substrate to produce an epidermis. Such products are used to treat burn patients as well as leg and foot ulcers that result from diabetic, from basically someone suffering from diabetes. This is one aspect of the larger field of tissue tissue engineering, which biotechnology um, companies hope that would be um, within a few decades, um, even to engineering um, replacement livers and other organs. This video works, so um, when you guys let's see, check and make sure. But when you view this video, it should take you to when you enter into that. When you click on that particular video, it will take you straight to here talking about skin grafting. So let's go ahead. So let's go ahead and look at this video as well as the one that I have um, as well as the other one that I have on Blackboard for you. The one on Blackboard is um, pretty graphic so make sure your child or anybody that cannot handle 
be anything gruesome. It is medical, so it's nothing X-rated, but um, if they cannot handle blood or surgery, that they should not look at this video. Just preparing you guys for the future. Uh, if you have any questions at all pertaining to Chapter 6, do not be afraid or do not hesitate to send me um, an email or just set, put it in the discussion board area. Because uh, if I don't get back to you on time with it, um, on a timely matter, somebody else, another student may be able to answer it for you. Okay? Um, hope you enjoyed this Chapter 6. I kind of like the tech entry system as well as cardiovascular system. But um, it's very interesting just to get some more.